Hi, it's Annelie again. This time in Kaput, near Berlin, where Albert Einstein built himself a summer house. This is a good place to meet Badri Krishnan, a scientist at the Albert Einstein Institute near here. He is one of those scientists who tried to observe black holes directly by detecting their gravitational waves. So why is it important to observe these black holes directly? So it's important because we think we understand them. So black holes, first of all, are a prediction of Einstein's theory, and it's a consequence of his theory that they exist, and they tell us something very deep about our space-time. And um, we think we understand them, but we won't know for sure till we actually see them. And the most direct way of seeing them is through gravitational waves. Are we still not sure? But we're still not sure. Okay. I think, it, isn't it strange that um, these scientists talk about black holes and say they're there, but they've never actually seen them? Yeah, so the only way that we can infer things about black holes normally is by the influence they have on things around them. So how they influence the stars around them and the space-time around them and so on. But gravitational waves tell us for the first time some a more direct way of seeing them or actually hearing them. And my hope is that we'll actually see them using gravitational waves and not just by images. Christian Art showed me his com supercomputer simulations of how stars collapse, and uh, John Centrella showed me her simulations of how black holes collide. But you're trying to use gravitational waves to see how these collide and form. Right, but it's actually a bit more like listening to them. Oh, okay. So we have a number of detectors operating around the world at the moment, so there's mm -hmm. about four of them. And these are enormous projects with lots of people and they cost lots of money. These detectors are really built on really very quiet places. Mm -hmm. okay. And these work by um, shining, bouncing off laser beam between mirrors, which are free to move horizontally. Mm -hmm. So when a wave passes by, it makes a mirror wiggle a little bit horizontally. Mm -hmm. And you want to pick that up using lasers which go back and forth the mirrors. Um, so that's a basic principle and it's called interferometer. Of course, there's lots of details behind it, but I think that's the basic idea behind, okay. behind it. And are things. these detectors already working? Yes, so we have already four detectors or five detectors, depending how you count, they're working at the moment. We already have data from them. we have searching um, this data for possible signals. And in fact, there might already be a signal in this data that we just haven't found so far. So they already, uh, they've already found? Oh, we haven't they're found them. So I'm just oh. saying that um, okay. Uh, at the moment, the signals are a bit too weak for these things to be detected. Mm -hmm. And um, so unlike a normal telescope, which, which gives an image of the system that you're looking at, so and an image has lots of pixels in it, um, so unlike that, for gravitational waves, what we have is just one data stream coming from these detectors. So it's a bit, it's a bit, so it's just, it's just one data stream, like listening to a, um, a song. So what are you expecting to hear? What is this data going to hear? Like? I actually have something to sh Oh, okay. For the sounds. Sounds like a jungle. Yeah, isn't it? So it's a bit like camping in the forest <laughs> and listening to the animals all around you. And you listen to the sound and then tell which animal it is. Nice. So this humming thing in the background, that's actually um, a bunch of uh, stars going around each other and producing a pure tone. Okay. And that pitch has been scaled up by 15 or 15 or 20 octaves to produce this image, this file here. Um, and if you listen to it again, this sound you see, which is increasing its pitch uh, and gives this zooming effect at the end. So that's two black holes oh. coalescing with each other. And also hidden in this uh, jungle of sounds here is also one big black hole and a small black hole uh, plunging into the big one. So if I show you, uh, let's go on to the next one, which is actually pretty interesting. So this was big black hole and a small black hole going around it and eventually plunging into the big one. And this was hidden in the jungle of noises in the other one that we heard earlier. So the basic problem is that, as far as we expect, the signals aren't strong enough to be detected easily at the moment. So they're buried in the noise that exists in the data from the detectors. How, how are you 
supposed to find them? We actually have a fairly good idea of what kind of signals we are ex looking for. Um, so as long as we know what to look for, then we can match patterns uh, with the data coming from detectors and we can hope to find the signals that we're looking for. So it's a little bit like listening to people talking in a crowded restaurant. Okay. Um, so for example, if you look at those two people over there, we can't, we can't understand what they're saying, but if uh, there's simple enough sound, like the sound of that wine glass, then we can train our ears to pick that up. Okay. So um, it's very similar to that. So we can train our computers to pick out um, particular signals or particular patterns that we're looking for, and uh, that's where. Yeah, but how do you train a computer? Well, we work very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, so we get lots of computers, yeah. uh, make them work together. We make sure that um, we tell the computers what to do. We come up with clever methods for these trainings and so on. But the sounds that black holes emit, they're very complicated. And you must know the sounds very well to tell a computer what exactly to listen for. Right. Uh, and amazingly, it turns out that black holes are really very simple objects. Um, so a black hole left all by itself in particular, it's really, really simple. So if you look at, for example, this mug, yeah. you need lots of things to describe this mug, right? You need to know how big it is, how wide it is, how big its handle is, what color it is. What color it is. Yeah. Um, so you need lots of numbers um, okay. in this way to describe this mug. But for a black hole left all by itself, the amazing thing is that you just need two numbers to describe everything about the black oh. hole. So, of course, this is not true when the black holes are colliding with yeah. each other. But before they collide and after the black holes have merged to form a single black hole, um, we just need these numbers. We just need these two numbers for each of the black holes. Um, so we believe that black holes are really very simple objects. And um, so we know what to expect uh, from black holes, more or less, by now. So even though they're quite simple, you're still going to need a, a lot of people to train these computers, right? Oh, yes, we do. And we need lots of people to produce the data. Right. Um, so these big detectors I was talking about earlier, yeah. Um, so these involve collaborations of around six or seven hundred people all working together um, on different aspects of the problem. There's some people involved in producing the data or doing experiments to make the detector better. And then there's a bunch of people, um, hundreds of people in fact, looking for ways to extract the signals from the noise. So you're one of these six or seven hundred One of these people. six or seven hundred people, yes. What, um, what exactly do you do? So the one thing I've been involved in recently is increasing the number of people to, uh, uh, which are working oh, okay. together. So there's these six or seven hundred people who are working on the detector and on the data. And there's also a hundred people or so working on these numerical okay. simulations, trying to understand what to expect. Um, and then um, the one thing I've been involved in is trying to use the information from these people doing simulations um, and how it affects our data analysis and, our, um, and what we look for in the, in the data. And so if this has been a lifelong passion of yours, what are you going to do when you finally find or detect these gravitational waves? Well, get very excited and celebrate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but really, I mean, finding them uh, the first time is just a start. Oh. We really want to understand things about astrophysical objects in more detail. So after the first detection is over, after the excitement has gone, so we really want to detect more and more and sort of um, make sure that Einstein's theory is right or or if we can quantify if it's wrong and by how much, and learn new things about astrophysical objects or stuff out there, and hopefully even find something new, something we haven't expected so far.